Take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. Last November, uh, as pastors, there's, there's five of us pastors here at the church, uh, we took one day and one night to get away and to spend some time praying together, some, spend some time connecting with each other. Now, um, naturally, since most of us were raised in the South, there's only one who wasn't, and he will remain nameless. But his name begins with an N and ends with an eight, and he grew up in California. He's good, though, we promise. Um, we, anyway, it's only natural for us to take shotguns and skeet along with us on a trip such as this, right? It's a natural thing to do. Um, we were having fun at one point. We were out shooting uh, skeet out over the lake, and don't worry, there were no boats on the water, so it was perfectly safe, I promise. And, um, and here, was, here was one thing that happened. Okay, I got a video I want to show you here. Y'all didn't know I was a trick shot artist, did you? Yeah? Um, <laughs> it happened one time, and don't ever expect for it to happen again, okay? It was, it was luck, I'm sure. I'm sure that's exactly what it was. But, but I said a phrase there at the very end of that. Um, it was, let's go, right? Let's go. Now, I said it with a really excited voice because I had just done something that I tried 20 times to do. It really wasn't 20 times. It was maybe like three or four, I don't know, something like that. But anyway, um, I was excited about it. So I said, let's go. Now, let's go is a phrase that you might have heard before when somebody's excited about something. Uh, let's go is a phrase that could be used by a military or an army as they're about to charge into battle, right? Let's go. Uh, in my house last night, there was myself and four boys, even though the youngest is only 15 months, I had him yelling, let's go, Duke. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Carolina. Let's go, right? It's something that, it's something that it, it communicates the excitement. It gives voice to the excitement in your heart, and it gives a voice to the, to the willingness that your body has to take action. Okay? It, it's one of those phrases, I'll say that again, it's one of those phrases that voices the excitement in your heart, and it voices the willingness of your body to take action with whatever it is in your heart. Today we're going to see a group of people who are ready to say, let's go. Let's go. We're in this series working through the book of Nehemiah, and, and in this study we are seeing God rebuild a place and revive a people. Rebuild a place and revive a people. Specifically today we're going to find that God is a big God who specializes in doing more than we can ask or imagine or even think up. It's kind of been a theme as we work through this series so far that, that God is bigger than what we can even imagine. And when God is big to us, great things will happen. Just by way of reminder, just so we can remember where we're at, we started this series three weeks ago, and on that Sunday we saw an introduction to the book of Nehemiah. We looked at the background. It was in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 that we were in that week. The next week we looked at the rest of chapter 1 at the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. We saw how to pray, but not only how to pray, we saw what we should pray. We should pray God-sized things. That's what Nehemiah is praying there. He's supposedly praying the impossible prayer. Then last week when we were together, we saw God begin to tangibly work in Nehemiah. This burden that God had placed on Nehemiah's heart is now, we see it starting to come to fruition. The king of Persia is commissioning Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem and rebuild that wall. All right, so that's where we get to this point. Um, I want to go to Nehemiah chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in verse 9. We're going to see Nehemiah arrive in Jerusalem. And listen, if you're able to, I would love for you to stand for the reading of God's Word, okay? Nehemiah chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people. Now I'm going to pause here for just a second. Sanballat and Tobiah 
are people that you're going to hear come up over and over again. I'm not going to talk about them today, but we're going to come back to them because they are important players in this story. All right? Verse 11, so I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, And I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the good hand of my God, that had been, the, of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, "Let us rise up and build." So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Oh, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, "What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king?" Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, as we approach your word today, um, we do so with humility, understanding that in your word is found life. Father, it is your very words breathed out for us today. So we can read and understand and then apply your word to our life. So, Father, as we approach this time, we do so humbly. Um, Lord, asking that you would speak to us. Father, would you sharpen us? Father, would you draw us closer to you? We love you, Father, and thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Nehemiah has arrived in Jerusalem. Now, this is a journey that would have taken about two months. In fact, it's a minimum of two months for this journey to take place. It may have taken as much as as three months to go from Susa to Jerusalem, all right? But now he is here. I want you to think with me for a moment. Last week when we were together, we talked about how Nehemiah had been fasting and praying for four months, okay? Then you go and you add on the two months. That's the minimum for Nehemiah to have arrived in Jerusalem, That means it's been six months since Nehemiah first started praying and pouring his heart out to God with this burden that God has given him to do something about Jerusalem. So that's six months of losing sleep, that's six months of fasting and praying, that's six months of planning, that is six months of anticipation, building, wondering what God is going to do, excited about what God is going to do. Now, if I'm Nehemiah, when I hit the ground in Jerusalem, I am ready to jump into the work. Let's go, right? Let's do this. But what is it that Nehemiah does first? He waits three days. He waits three days. Now, as we work through this passage for today, I'm going to give you a few statements that kind of highlight the narrative that we're talking about here, okay? So pull out your bulletins, write on the back of them, write down these statements. And here's the first statement you want to write down. And that is that Nehemiah had tactical patience. Nehemiah had tactical patience. Now, here's the definition of tactical from the dictionary. All right, it is showing skill in planning or maneuvering to accomplish a purpose. Showing skill in planning or maneuvering to accomplish a purpose. All right, so when I take the word tactical and patience and put it together, here's what I'm talking about it's being patient to wait for the right timing to take action. But while you're waiting, Get this, while you're waiting, you're also planning and strategizing so you're ready when the time comes to take that action. It's exactly what Nehemiah does when he gets to Jerusalem. For three days, he doesn't take any action to complete the mission that he's there to do. Now, while he's there, I'm I'm pretty sure he's thinking, he's praying, he's strategizing, he's meeting people, he's talking with people, trying to figure out, okay, well, who will be good for this part? Even though he's not telling them, here's what we're here to do, he's thinking, I wonder who has the skills to complete this job. 
Now, we're not told why he waits for three days, but I'm pretty sure one reason is um, the fact that he's just traveled for two months to get to Jerusalem. Two months is a long time to travel. Uh, how many of you have ever traveled two months to get anywhere? And if you have, you're doing it the wrong way, all right? We've got plenty of technology in this world now to where you don't have to travel for two months to get anywhere. It wasn't that long ago that we flew to Israel, right? And that was a long flight, what, 10, 11 hours, something like that. But we went five, over 5,000 miles in 10 hours. Two months is a really, really long time to be traveling. I can imagine that Nehemiah took that opportunity, those three days, to rest. Nehemiah may be a man who's being used mightily by God, but he's still a man who needs to rest and take care of himself physically. Folks, everybody needs a break sometimes. Everybody needs to slow down and rest. And I think that Nehemiah uses this tactical patience to his advantage so he can rest. Now, folks, that's a really, really great lesson for us. Um, a friend of mine who once said, and he's, he's actually told me this many times, he says, give it sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is rest. The most spiritual thing you can do is rest. To dedicate some time for your body and your mind to be restored. Nehemiah starts off this time in Jerusalem using tactical patience. He doesn't just jump in right away with what is on his heart. All right, but then we continue. Here's the next highlight that I've got for you to write down, okay? Nehemiah knew the value of solid information. Nehemiah knew the value of solid information. Uh, he'd been in Jerusalem for three days. So now Nehemiah gathers a few men, and he goes out, and he inspects the walls. But he goes at nighttime, so, not, so, so nobody's suspicious about what he's doing. And I'm going to pick up reading here in verse 12, okay? Nehemiah says, Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, that there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Now, as I'm reading gates and I'm reading walls and all of that stuff, you might be thinking, I have no idea what that means. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Later on, take this passage of Scripture and Google a map of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time, and it will show you where these are at. So it will show you the track that he goes around Jerusalem there, all right? But Nehemiah... Um, you can imagine him sneaking out at night with just a few men with him. Uh, they don't even know what Nehemiah is doing because very, it's very clear here. Nehemiah had told no one what God had placed on his heart. So I believe that these were probably part of the military escort that came with him from Persia. He goes out to get a look at the wall, and he starts on the west side. All right, Then he moves south before coming up on the east side. And it appears as if most of his attention is, is directed on the southern portion of Jerusalem. And we know that it's in his heart. He wants to go all the way around to see the whole thing, but he's not able to because the conditions are so bad. His animal can't pass for him to do so. So after he's done with this ride, he returns back to where he's staying. Nehemiah knew the value of having solid information in his hand. In order to fully understand what was taking place, Nehemiah needed to put his eyes on what was happening. He needed to put his eyes on what was happening. Y'all, here's the deal. It makes no sense whatsoever for us to live in a dream world. It makes no sense for anybody to live in a dream world. Fiction is, fiction is great in books, right? I enjoy a good fiction book here and there. But fiction is horrible when it comes to real life. There comes a point in which we got to face the facts honestly and accept the bad news as much as we accept the good news. During those three days that Nehemiah is with the people there in Jerusalem, he hasn't ridden out to see the walls for himself yet. He's only hearing what other people have to say about it. And I can imagine he would hear things like, you know what, the walls really aren't that bad, I don't think. Um, we're not in that much danger from outside forces. There's only this army and that army and that army that want to overtake us. But you know what? It's not so bad. We'll be just fine staying like this. 
These residents of Jerusalem had been there, some of them for decades, some of them for only about 15 years. But sometimes when you have lived in the middle of a difficult circumstance for a time, you can begin to morph into a perception that the difficult circumstance is better off than it really is. It makes you think, you know what, things aren't really as bad as I, as I initially thought. Your perception begins to morph into the thought that the difficult circumstances are really not that bad after all. But it's at that point that reality hasn't changed. The reality is the same, right? But your perception of reality has changed. So it begins to take place. The reality hasn't changed. It is, it is what it is, but your perception of reality has started to change. I want to equate that to us here for just a moment. And there's several ways that I can do this, but, but here's, here's one that I really want to hit home with. And that is this, that, that we live in a world in which sin and death and destruction are all around us. We see it on a daily basis. You turn the news on and you don't have to watch very long to where you see, uh, you know what, we just live in a, in a sinful, broken world. And sometimes it would be easy for us to get so caught up in the way things are that we miss what they were supposed to look like. We forget that God's original design for our world was for us to live in relationship with Him, in close relationship with Him. And it could be easy for us to look around at this world and say, you know what, this world is not that bad. Completely missing the fact that there's people all around us who are dying and going to hell because they don't have a relationship with God. Folks, let's not get so caught up in this world that we forget we were made to live in another one. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through, the song says, right? But while I'm here on this earth, I've been given an assignment from Jesus to make him famous wherever I go. In the middle of confusion, a believer has got to be able to view the world long enough to see the reality, to see it for what it is, but then jump in there with the job that God has given us in his ministry of reconciliation. The reality doesn't change, but our perception of reality does sometimes change. So we go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes on this night ride to see the reality. Nehemiah needs to see for himself what's really going on. I love what Warren Wearsby says. He makes this comment. He says, Nehemiah saw more at night than the residents saw in the daylight, for he saw the potential as well as the problems. Nehemiah saw more in the night than the residents saw during the daylight because he saw the potential as well as the problems. As Nehemiah is out inspecting those walls, he's not just looking at destruction. Even though there's destruction all around him, he's also looking at potential. What could be done with this? I can imagine him thinking. What could be done in the future for the glory of God and the good of these Jews in Jerusalem? What can be done? Would have been his thought. Church, listen, um, there is a time for looking at the destruction around us. In fact, we talked about that the very first week that we were together in this series. Destruction is all around, right? Open your eyes and see the destruction. However, there is also a time for looking at the potential. We don't get so, so, so bogged down in the destruction that we completely miss the potential around us. There is that time for taking a hard look at reality, for not living in that dream world, but living in the hard truth of where we're at. The beautiful thing about serving a big God is that he specializes in redeeming the broken things of this world. Some of you are here today, and as you look at your life, all you see is the destruction of broken relationships and, and, and damaged trust and no hope. Some of you, that's what you see when you look at your life. You don't see what could be because you're so blinded by the heartache and the disappointment that seems like it dominates your life. About the time it seems like you get a breath of fresh air, all of a sudden you're going under again. And you're wondering, am I ever, ever going to make it in this world? Can I ever make it in this world? You're like the people of the, the city of Jerusalem. You've tried to rebuild those broken down walls. They're all around, and you've done what you could to, to rebuild them, but it seems like roadblock after roadblock comes up, and you've gotten nowhere, and so now you've simply resigned yourself to living in the middle of that destruction. You know what? I can't do anything about it, so I'm just going to live in the middle of it. When all along God is looking at you, and he's telling you that, yes, it may be tough, and yes, the reality is that there is heartache, but that he's big enough to handle your destruction. He's big enough to handle your destruction. 
Folks, in many ways, Nehemiah is like Jesus, coming to live in the middle of the brokenness of this world, but coming for the purpose of showing people that God has not forgotten them, that he's doing what's necessary to bring about redemption. Nehemiah is willing to immerse himself in the destruction to bring about redemption. That's the same thing that Jesus is going to do a little bit later, except on a much larger scale. You see, there was a time in which Jesus, as the Son of God, stepped down into, the, into this world that was filled with sin and death and brokenness, and he did what was necessary to bring mankind into a relationship with God. He died a death he didn't deserve to die in my place so I could have life, eternal life. You might be here today and you're so accustomed to the destruction around you that you've started to accept it. Or, or maybe you think that there's no way out of it. While there's a time for seeing the destruction, there is also a time for taking action in the middle of that destruction. If you're here today and you're one of those people that I'm talking about where you feel stuck, I can't breathe anymore. I can't go from day to day anymore. Is there any hope in this life anymore? Much like the people in Jerusalem might have been feeling. They cannot tell you today that there is hope. And our God is extending an offering of a relationship with him and eternal life. He's calling you to take action in the middle of your destruction. If you want to know more about what that looks like, come talk to me after the service or talk to another Christian around you. What in the world does this mean? I'd love to talk with you about it. I, I love doing that. God is calling you out of the destruction into life with him. So going back to Nehemiah, he's gone out, he's looked at broken down walls, He's seen more in a night than most people see in the daytime. He sees the problems, but he also sees the solutions. So what's the next step? Here it is. Nehemiah says, let's go. All right, let's go. Read in verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we, are, we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. For they said, let us rise up and build. And they strengthened their hands for the good work. Folks, if you mark your Bibles, um, I, I want to encourage you to mark your Bibles with three words in verse 17, okay? Look at verse 17. You can draw a circle around it. You can underline it. You can draw a box around it. You can heart, whatever you want to draw, okay? But here's three words that you want to take note of. There's the word we, the word us, and the word we again. Nehemiah says, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Nehemiah personally identified with the difficult circumstance that these Jews are in. He didn't cast blame. He didn't, he didn't accuse previous generations. He didn't point his finger and say, this person's at fault. No, he just said, hey, here's the reality. Here's where we're at. So let's move forward. Let's do something about this. He simply pointed out that problem and said, let's take action. And they did. I love what Chuck Swindoll says. By the way, he's got a, an excellent book on the, on the book of Nehemiah that he wrote. It's entitled, Hand Me Another Brick. Hand me another brick. And if you get a chance sometime, you should buy that book and read along as we work through this study. All right, but here's what he says. Nehemiah didn't promise material incentives when he addressed the Jerusalem officials. He didn't offer prizes to the fastest working families or a week at the Dead Sea for the group that's doing the most attractive work. Nehemiah simply said, see the ruins? We're in a terrible strait. Let's rebuild this wall. And the people said, let's do it. Let's go. Earlier, I showed you a video from a few months ago when the five of us as pastors got away for a couple of days. What you wouldn't have seen in that video was the five of us earlier that morning gathered around a dining room table, pouring our hearts out before the Lord and asking him to work as only he can through our church. What you didn't see is each of us begging God for the faith needed to see him accomplish the impossible. 
each of us asking God to do great things in our church and in our city through the ministry of this church. There was a phrase that came out of that prayer time, and it was, it was a really simple one. Father, let's go. Father, let's go. It wasn't a, pro- it wasn't a prayer of pride. It was a prayer of humility. It was a prayer of, of brokenness. It was a prayer that gave voice to the excitement in our hearts, and it gave voice to the willingness in our bodies to take action. Church, we serve a big, big God. He's a God that calls us to follow him to big things. There comes a time in which he gives that burden, just like he did with Nehemiah. He gave Nehemiah that burden. There's that period of time allowing that burden to mature, just like he did with Nehemiah. Those four months of that burden maturing inside of him. There's a time of gathering information like Nehemiah has done here and going out and seeing the wall and talking with people. But there comes a point in which it's time to say, let's go. Very soon, our church is going to be at a point in which each individual member in our church as a whole will be faced with a decision of whether or not to say, let's go. And put action to what God's calling us to do. Some of you are here in this room and and you have a God-given burden to do something and and it's something big for God, or maybe it's something that maybe is is somewhat insignificant, but you've been chewing on this burden for this this burden long enough. That burden is long past mature. And it's time for you to just simply say, let's go. Let's do this. I don't know what it might be, but there's, there's, there's a good chance that in a room this size that there's some people that God has been burdening you to do something and you've been wrestling with it and, and, and man, that thing is long past mature. And you say, all right, let's go. Some of you have been fighting for control of your finances. You've been fighting for control of your relationships. You've been fighting for control of your job. There comes a point in which you just have to simply say, let's go and take a leap of faith and say, God, I don't know what you've got for me, but I want to trust you and lean into you and let you do whatever it is you want to do. Nehemiah had come to the point in which it was time to say, let's go. And when he did, God came through in a really big way. Church, are you ready to say, let's go and whatever it is that God's calling you to do? Here's the last point that I want you to highlight and write down in your bulletin. Nehemiah trusted in the bigness of his God. I'm going to read here, starting in verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. The God of heaven will make us prosper, Nehemiah says. Did Nehemiah say, I'm going to do this thing. Y'all need to get out of the way. I'm coming through. No, his first response is, the God of heaven, the God, this big God will make us prosper. Even though there's adversity, even though there's problems that stand in the way, God will make us prosper. Folks, when you say, let's go, you cannot trust in yourself because yourself will lie to you and deceive you every single time. When you say, let's go, you had better be ready to trust in an all-powerful, all-knowing God, a big God. He is the one who's going to make it succeed. Just don't forget his ability to make possible the impossible in your life. I want to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Some of you know what I'm talking about when I say that you've got a burden. Something that you feel like God's calling you to do, has been calling you to do for some time, and and you just haven't responded with a let's go, let's do this. Some of you today just need to simply say, all right, God, let's go. Others of you may be here and and 
you know what, you, you just, you're praying, God, would you do something? I don't know what, what, but would you do something in my life? I need you to show up in a big way. And it's not that he's necessarily placed a burden on you, but you know that you're, you're devoid of him doing any kind of work inside of you. Well, that's an opportunity for you to say, let's go. We're going to sing a song here in just a moment. Yes, I will. And, and while we sing that song, think about those words, let's go. What is the Holy Spirit sharing with you, asking you to do? Father, thank you for our time here in, in Nehemiah chapter 2. Father, thank you for this example. And next week we're going to see even more about what it means to let's go. Father, would you do what you want in and through us? We love you. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.